Hello everyone. Welcome back to you all in the third part of the series Fundamental Facts of English Literature. As we have already discussed about fathers of important literary genres, pioneers, important literary authors with their titles as well as the reasons why are they called so. In uh, the previous two series, two parts, and we have discussed them uh, from 14th century uh, to the 18th century. And here we are going to start with the advent of novel in the 18th century. Now, this is the first thing which we are going to discuss today. Actually, this is debatable which one is considered the first novel because first novel has not been absolutely unanimously determined yet. George Sainsbury declared Pamela the first novel in English history. The reason behind it that this epistolary novel inaugurates a whole tradition in the English novel. Virtue Rewarded is another title of Pamela. But uh, although this is the first novel, this can be said the first novel, but credit goes to Fielding to be the father of English novel, as said by Walter Scott. The reason behind it is that for the first time he formulated the techniques of writing novel in the prefaces of uh, Joseph Andrews and Tom Jones and accepted Walter Scott was himself called the uh, father of historical novels in English. In the history of English novel, it is very well known fact that four novelists are known uh, uh, as the four pillars or the four wheels of English novels. They are respectively Henry Fielding, Samuel Richardson, Lawrence Stern and Tobias Smollett. In the last of 18th century, the history of English literature has seen the transition in literary concepts. Thomas Creeve was the great transitional poet because he showed, this is to be noted, why is he called the transitional poet? Because he showed his merit between the neoclassical and romantic age. It is said that he began his career as classical but ended as a romantic poet. And in this reference, he can be called one of the precursors of Romantic era. At that time, Romantic poets revolted against the poetic rules and regulation of 18th century. Wordsworth, along with Coleridge, released lyrical ballads in 1798, which set the tone for the Romantic age. This was the reason that Wordsworth is called the father of Romanticism. Clear? He is honored with many titles as the poet of nature, as, uh, as said by Shelley, highest priest of nature, as said by Arnold, and he declared himself as the worshipper of nature. Do you know in which poem? In his poem, Tintern Abbey. Actually, long before the scientist J.C. Bose declaration that plants have life. Wordsworth had already felt the omnipresence and omnipotence of nature, so paid the highest tribute to it by spiritualizing nature in his poems. He has spiritualized the nature. That's why he is known as the poet of nature. Now Keats addressed him as a poet of egotistical sublime. According to Keats, Artists of fixed opinions suffer from egotistical sublime and remained obsessed over singular truths. So now what happened that Browning went to the extent of calling him the lost leader and Shelley called him a moral owner? It seems something bizarre. It seems something strange. Why uh, were these titles entitled to him? As you know that Wordsworth was deeply influenced with French Revolution and its impact was seen in his life and poetry. In, uh, try to understand it clearly. So French Revolution had a great effect upon the works of Wordsworth. In 1792, 
he found that conservative opinion in England is strongly against the revolution. His moral nature received a terrible shock when England disillusionment with France was complete and he became Tory. Tory means conservative. So because of this lapse from his high idealism causes to earn such titles for him. Do you understand that? He is one of the late poets. It was the group of three English poets who all lived in the Lake District of England. They were Wordsworth, Coleridge and Robert Southey. So that's why they are called Lake Poets. Another romantic poet, Coleridge, was the high priest of romanticism. Now whereas Wordsworth deals, what is the difference between Wordsworth and Coleridge's approach to nature? Where is Wordsworth deals with the spiritual aspect of nature, Coleridge deals with the philosophical aspect of supernatural. He chooses this unique field just to describe, just to describe what is unseen and beyond nature. But in spite of creating horror, he skillfully handles the species of supernatural whose essence is entirely psychological. He is famous as an opium eater also. It is said that uh, he was in great need of some financial success with his poetry. So he intentionally attempted to portray himself as a dreamy opium eater because he believed that it would draw morbid fascination to his work. Next, we will discuss about John Keats, another uh, one of the great poets of romantic era he who died at the age of 26 only 26 due to tuberculosis <laughs> at first time he defines his own identity as a chameleon poet chameleon this creature has been used in figurative sense to describe a form of self endowed with ability to change i think that it should be known to all Another term he used, negative capability. In 1817, just to explain, uh, just to explain the capacity of the greatest writers to pursue a vision of artistic beauty, even in intellectual confusion and uncertainty, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. And then another term uh, about his Hellenism. Hellenism means imitation of ancient Greek culture. So about his Hellenism, Shelley said that he was a Greek. Why? It should be noted here that he was a Greek in mind and spirit and he could enter imaginatively into the world of Greek ancients and classical myths. Next, Arnold called him he is with Shakespeare. Actually, Keats was so influenced by, uh, by Shakespeare that he kept his bust beside him while he wrote hoping that Shakespeare will spark his creativity. Is it very amazing fact? Isn't it? Then he declared him for himself that my name is writ in water. As I have already told you that his short life was embittered by discouragement and sickness. He desired these words to mark his grave. Here lies one whose name is written water. He meant to say that he would be forgotten soon after his death. Now about his sensuousness. You should know that he is a mystic of the senses and not of thoughts. Hmm. He used to apprehend the ultimate truth of universe through aesthetic sensations. His contemporary poet Byron once remarked him a tadpole, tadpole of the lens. This is very strange remark, isn't it? Uh, this remark was in reference to his poetic works actually. At that time he entirely disagreed on Keats' poetic achievements, although later on he came to appreciate his work. He is also referred to as a pure poet. Because he has done poetry for the sake of poetry. He was not a reformer. Influence of his poetry on the minds of the readers is not social or moral, rather 
is thirty. A lot of towns are associated with so young poet. He is also called the poet of beauty. He made beauty his object of wonder and admiration, and he became the greatest poet of beauty. Some famous quoted lines are, "A thing of beauty is a joy forever," and another one, "Beauty is truth, truth beauty." That's all. It reminds us, "Satyam shivam sundaram." So in this way, we see that Keats believes in beauty, in aesthetics rather than social reforms. On the contrary, Shelley was born revolutionary, and he had firm faith in the regeneration of mankind. His motto of life was to liberate mankind from the tyranny of all types. His Ode to the West Wind is a poetic manifestation of his hope and idea of regeneration. If winter comes, cases can spring be far behind. So his passionate search for personal love, social justice, and revolutionary thoughts made him the most revolutionary of the romantic poets. Arnold called him an ineffectual angel. He referred it in his essay in criticism. Note it, essay in criticism. He has referred this term to him. Actually, in his short tenure of life, he did not taste the success and fame as he died at the age of, do you know, at the age of thirty only by drowning. His poetic achievements steadily grew after his death. <laughs> That's why he is described as an ineffectual angel, beating in the void his luminous wings in vain. now this was all in my store today we will meet in next part of the series when where we will discuss about the further important literary facts till then take care thank you